Well, good morning. I hope everybody's doing good this morning. I want to welcome you and thank you for joining us today at Community Life Church on this absolutely beautiful Sunday morning. I mean, these days are just amazing as spring is coming in and as we're moving towards summer. But I want to welcome you and thank you for being here today. My name is Scott Barino and I'm the lead pastor here at Community Life. And it is an honor uh, to have this time with you today. Um, so a couple quick announcements and then we'll get up and we'll get started in the service. Uh, so uh, registration for Vacation Bible School is going on right now. And so if you have children or grandchildren or children in your community that you want to get registered, make sure that you do that. Uh, we already, we've been only been open for about a week and a half in registration. We've already have over 500 children registered. So make sure you go ahead and get the word out there because it's filling up pretty quickly. We want to go ahead and get everybody signed up for that. And then, ladies, we are registering for the IF gathering, which is coming up real soon. And so when this service is over, there will be a group of ladies out in the lobby to give you some more information and get you signed up. You guys ready for a great Sunday? Awesome. I invite you, if you will, to go ahead and stand. And uh, let's start the service off by praying the Lord's Prayer together. Let's do that. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Heavenly Father, we love you. And we're just so grateful for the opportunity to gather in this space. Lord, and thinking about all of our brothers and sisters that are logging in online. God, we just pray a blessing over everyone that's joining us today. God, and even those that, that maybe decide to try and sleep in. I just pray that you would bless them, bring healing to their bodies. Uh, all of us have things that we're walking through and that we're struggling with. And, and Lord, you are the God that is present to us in these moments. And actually, in all moments. And so, Lord, I just pray that, that you would be God today. Love us, care for us, lead us, and guide us. We love you. And it's in the name of your son, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Y'all remain standing. Here's a hymn for you called In the Garden. I come to the garden alone While the dew is still on the road And the voice I hear Falling on my ear The Son of God discloses And He walks with me and he talks with me and he tells me I am his own and the joy we share as we tarry there none other has ever known he speaks and the sound of his voice is so sweet, the birds hush their singing, and the melody that he gave to me within my heart is ringing. And talks with me and he tells me I am his own and the joy we share as we tarry there none other has ever Father, thank you that you walk with us and talk with us throughout our lives, Lord. We thank you for being here for, with us and for us each and every day of our lives. We thank you for each and every one that's joined us this morning on this beautiful Sunday morning. It's a day that we give back to you. We ask your blessings on Jim this morning as he delivers our continuing Bible study. Bless this place, bless each and every one of us, and bless God as he delivers your continuing series today. You know our hearts, you know our needs. We ask all these blessings in your holy name. Amen. You may be seated. Good morning, Ronnie. How are you?
Well, I'm not a fan of daylight savings time. But here we are. Okay. You know, all that took place that we've been looking at for weeks now in the life of Abraham, really it's a really a relatively great accurate picture of what happens in our own lives on a spiritual basis. Because when Abraham, in obedience to the call of God that, he, that, that, he, that came to him, you know, he came into the land of Canaan from outside. And it was a, really a picture of a, the individual coming to the Lord Jesus Christ. So this is where we're making the spiritual uh, movement back to see how did this involve us spiritually when this all took place literally uh, back in the times of Abraham. So just as that was God's beginning work with Abraham when he called him out of this place uh, near in Babylonia, so just as that was the beginning of God's work in this man's life, it's the same way when we come to Christ, guess what? Our work is just starting as well. It's the beginning of God's work in your life. You haven't arrived at all. You are really getting started now. You know, and that is a sense of where challenges and problems occur, and they begin there. There's an old, old expression, and I think it accurately describes God's problem that he had with Abraham as we've looked at these incidents in Abraham's life. And that is the old adage of, it's easy to take the boy out of the country, but it's really hard to take the country out of the boy. And that really, when we've looked at some of the stories of Abraham, that really is what God's problem is with, with um, this buddy Abraham. You know, he called him out of this land called a city called Ur of the Chaldeans, which is in present-day southern Iraq. But it was hard to get the Chaldea out of Abraham as he's lived his life. Now, it may not be difficult for some people to come to Christ, but to get the old Adamic nature, the old human nature that we've been carrying with us, how to get that controlled and learn, and learn to walk in the Spirit rather than just go the way things were before. That's a problem. That's a problem for us. And that's what takes God's grace if we're going to live that type of a life. It's a process of heartache. It's a process that's interspersed with great seasons of joy and blessings and then tribulation and failures and falling off the cliff and all that stuff. Because I'll tell you what, your old human nature dies hard, and it fights back, sometimes very overtly, sometimes very subtly, and it invents a thousand and one excuses to get us to leave us alone. Just, God, leave me alone. I've got this handled. I've got this controlled. I know where everything is now. Don't give me any new stuff here. Of course, <laughs> Who here has ever had God leave them alone? God never leaves anyone alone. Now, in this closing section of chapter 21 of Genesis, we have a, we have a scene of a relative calm and a relative peace. Things are pretty calm and cool and collected. And there are three different stories in this, late, this latter section of chapter 21. The first story is the story of Hagar and Ishmael, who are out in the wilderness. We then have the story of Abraham and a Philistine king by the name of Abimelech making a covenant, a contract, if you will. And finally, we have the scene of Abraham and his family living around a well. And they're just living there and enjoying the presence and the, and the fullness of God. Now, the well around which all these stories occurs is the central theme of all of these stories. You know, it would be easy to dismiss some of this stuff that, oh, this is really a detail we don't need to have, and why would you put that detail in there? Except there is nothing 
unimportant in the Word of God. Doesn't matter where you're at. There is nothing included, even though it may seem to be the trivial of trivials regarding the stories and so forth, that isn't there because it has a purpose. And it illustrates and it helps us as we read this word thousands of years later to grasp some concept of this spiritual life. And we need to learn it. And it is a lesson for us. So the spiritual significance of the well that we're going to see here is easy for us to identify since it so frequently is in the Bible. We see it all over the place. And all the time we see it in the Bible, it indicates it's a picture of the Word of God. The water in the well is always Jesus Christ in His refreshing aspect. It's the source of refreshment. It's the, it, it's the satisfying of the human soul, the thirsty soul. You know, you remember, you go back to the story in the New Testament about how the Lord said and had that altercation, if you will, the meeting of the Sumerian woman at the well. They were at the well. She's pulling water out, and Jesus says, would you give me something to drink? And what Jesus finally says to her, he says, the water I give will become a spring of water welling up to eternal life. It's not the water you've always been drinking. I can offer you something so much better than that. So whenever you find, when you do your readings in your Bible and you find a reference or a well in Scripture, it is always picturing that relationship that a believer has with Jesus Christ. Now, with that sort of a, as a prelude, if you will, a summary, let's look at, uh, let's look at this clue. Let's look at these stories and see how this well of Christ appears in various ways. So if you've got your Bibles, Genesis chapter 21, I'm going to start in verse 14. Early the next morning, Abraham took some food and a skin of water and gave them to Hagar. He set them on her shoulders and then sent her off with the boy. She went on her way and wandered in the desert of Beersheba. When the water in the skin was gone, she put the boy under one of the bushes. Then she went off and sat down nearby about a bow shot away, for she thought, I cannot watch the boy die. And as she sat there nearby, she began to sob. God heard the boy crying, and the angel of God called to Hagar from heaven and said to her, What is the matter, Hagar? Do not be afraid. God has heard the boy crying as he lies there. Lift the boy up and take him by the hand, for I will make him into a great nation. Then God opened her eyes, and she saw a well of water. So she went and filled the skin with water and gave the boy a drink. God was with the boy as he grew up. He lived in the desert and became an archer. While he was living in the desert of Paran, his mother got a wife for him from Egypt. If you go to the New Testament, specifically go to the book of Galatians, Paul has something to say about this very incident we're talking about here in the 21st chapter. He tells us how to interpret Hagar and Ishmael and what they mean to us as far as how God puts forth his program. And he says, Hagar is a picture of Mount Sinai in Arabia. And Mount Sinai, of course, is where the law was given to Moses. And she, Hagar and Ishmael, is a picture of the nation of Israel. This is what we had learned from Galatians. They're a picture of the nation of Israel who refused Christ. And yet, at the same time in refusing Christ, they yet retained the promises and God's preserving care and grace in their lives, even though they're walked away. You know, Israel persecuted all of those, think about it, the nation of Israel persecuted all those within the nation who turned to Christ in those very, very early days of the very early church. They were tough on 
those people. You go to the book of Romans, Paul tells us that the nation of Israel has rejected Christ. And he says that blindness came upon a part of Israel which would last until the Gentiles who would believe had come into the fold. Like Ishmael, the nation of Israel has wandered in the desert all over the world all these years, ever since the day the people said that during that Passion Week, remember what they said? We don't want this man to reign over us. He's not the Messiah. We don't want any parts of him. So if he's killed, if he's crucified, if he dies, his blood be on us and his blood be on our children. Shortly after those words were spoken, the city of Jerusalem was destroyed. The temple was ransacked, demolished, and Israel driven out like Ishmael into the desert for years without any central place of gathering. They didn't have any real worship of God taking place. And it was totally different than what it was back in the Old Testament times, which they loved to draw upon. The issue here is Israel has been wandering in the wilderness ever since. But a day is coming, because the New Testament tells us that a new day is coming, and and says, when the eyes of Israel will be opened, just as Hagar's eyes are opened in the story we just read. She saw the well. She drank from the well. And we're going to see the same thing happening to the nation of Israel. Remember, the well is the word of God. And it portrays Jesus Christ. So maybe we're getting near that day. Maybe we're getting close to that day when Israel, the nation that has been wandering around in disbelief, unbelief, all over the earth, ever since that time, maybe soon they're going to have their eyes open and see Christ once again as he reveals himself in their own scripture. You know, a whole lot of people, I I see this, this question gets asked me all the time. Many people ask, why do the Jews not believe in Christ if the Old Testament is so full of Jesus Christ? Jesus Christ is everywhere in the Old Testament. And people ask that question, especially when we do our coursework upstairs. When we do like Bible basics and we spend 14 weeks in the Bible and we cover a lot of these indicators of Jesus Christ in the Old Testament, people come up to me and say, Jim, why don't they they believe? It's right there in front of them. It's just like, it can't be a coincidence. There's just so many issues. There are so many signposts. And I one time had a Messianic Jew in one of my classes years ago. And I was excited because here I was going to get the answer to that question. They wouldn't have to hear it from me. They could hear it from someone who lived that life. And I got excited. And that question came up and I said, I'm not going to answer the question, but he is. Why don't they come? Why don't they believe? And the answer was, I don't know. <laughs> oh. It was, it was well intended, but it didn't work out the way I wanted it to. The answer, really, to that question is really found in the New Testament book of Romans. And this is what Paul says. He says this in chapter 11, second part of verse 25. He says, Israel has experienced a hardening in part until the full number of the Gentiles has come in. So God has hardened the hearts of a great population of his people until us, non-Jews, are called by God and come in. Not all Jews refuse to believe, but many of them 
even with the testimony of their own scripture, which is the Old Testament, they don't believe that Jesus is the Messiah. God says, though, that a day will come at last when their eyes are going to be opened. And they're going to see in the Word the very one that they had rejected. And he's going to inhabit the earth. And God's going to be with them. And like Ishmael here, he will make them a great nation again. So that's all portrayed as we read this, old, this section of, of chapter 21 of Genesis. It's, you can almost see it coming. The next section, we have the well appearing in an entirely different aspect. Back to Genesis chapter 21. We're going to start at verse 22. At that time, Abimelech and Phicol, the commander of his forces, said to Abraham, God is with you in everything you do. Now swear to me here before God that you will not deal falsely with me or my children or my descendants. Show to me and the country we are living as an alien the same kindness I have shown to you. Abraham said, I swear it. Then Abraham complained to Abimelech about a well of water that Abimelech's servants had seized. But Abimelech said, I don't know who has done this. You did not tell me, and I heard about it only today. So Abraham brought sheep and cattle and gave them to Abimelech, and the two men made a treaty. Abraham set apart seven ewe lambs from the flock, and Abimelech asked Abraham, what is the meaning of these seven ewe lambs you have set apart by themselves? He replied, Accept these seven lambs from my hand as a witness that I dug this well. So that place was called Beersheba because the two men swore an oath there. After the treaty had been made at Beersheba, Abimelech and Phicol, the commander of his forces, returned to the land of the Philistines. Now, that all seems a little strange when we read that. You know, in effect, what Abimelech says to Abraham is, basically what he's saying to him is, I don't understand you people. You know, I've been living here for a long time, and this is where my people are. I don't understand you. You guys, I'm trying to figure it out, but you guys are a mystery to me because you have this remarkable ability to stir people up and to really get the apple cart upset. And I'm not sure why, why you do that. But because you do, I would like you to promise me something, please. Please promise me this. I'm a Philistine. I am not Jewish. I'm a Philistine. But we have different objectives here. You are an alien. You're a pilgrim. You are a sojourner into this land. And you keep referring to a city. And we aren't at all interested in this city and what you're talking about. We have cities of our own right now, and they're here. Now, Abraham, here's what I'd like you to do. I want you to promise me, please promise me that you won't get involved in our plans and our programs and the way we run our nation. Because I, I recognize how powerful you are. I've seen the signs. I've seen what's happened. But please promise me this. Now, Abraham is listening to that, and he says, no problem. I'll be happy to, because I really have no interest in your cities, in your programs, in your plans. I have no interest in your politics. But there is one thing that's bothering me, and you need to know about it. He says, see this well? See this well? It represents something to me. It means something to me. It's the place of refreshment where my soul goes and drinks and it meets God. And you know what's happened? Your men have been trying to take that away from me. Now, I know you say you knew nothing about all this. But Abimelech, I want you to know just how precious this well and this water is to me. So please take these seven little lambs and offer them up as a perpetual reminder that this well means life 
and death to me. That's how important it is. I cannot give up this will because it is the source of everything that, is, that, I, that makes up me. My refreshment, it's my strength, it's my wisdom, it's my life. We read a story like that and you say, well, that's actually happened to Abraham and Abimelech. Well, how does that apply to me today? Well, how does that connect with our lives 4,000 years later? The Word of God, this book, the Bible, it's our will. It is your will. It is our will. It's my will. It contains, it holds the waters of life. It holds the waters of refreshment. It's a well in which we can find that which ministers to the deepest needs of our souls. And that has always been the ground of struggle, of disagreements, of fights, of quarrels, and so forth with world religious groups who see it as nothing more, they don't see this as nothing more as a collection of old Hebrew stories that don't apply to anything. You know, it's sprinkled in with a look. Yeah, there's some wisdom in there. Now, we see the wisdom in there. It makes sense. There's great literature in there. Very sage literature. There's things I can learn. But, you know, it's really more mythology than anything else. It really doesn't apply to anything. It's just something that's good to have. So, people, a lot of people don't see this as having any supernatural significance of the heart. Yet, it is our will. It means to us exactly what that well meant to Abraham. So the question becomes, to what extent then should the church, the church universal, so what extent should the church get themselves involved in programs and initiatives that are aimed at correcting all the social problems, the social ills that are rampant in the world today? And there are plenty of them. Don't have to straighten them. Don't have to tell you about all the things that are out there. Let's take a lesson from what we just learned of from Abraham and Abimelech. Abimelech says to Abraham, you are different than us. The world outside is different than the church. You are involved here as a pilgrim and a stranger. You are really passing through this land. Please don't get involved with fixing us. Don't do that. Please don't do this. Don't demand that we be like you. And Abraham's response is basically says, you got it. I'll be glad to. Not going to get involved. Got to be careful. We need to be careful, however, that our involvement, our involvement does not become a case of the good being an enemy or an opponent of the best. Because we can fall into that trap. Programs and policies that alleviate human suffering, the issues we see out there, are good things. They're very good things. And Christians are responsible before God for doing all we can to help, to aid. When we see injustice and we see starvation, we see problems, we see things going wrong, we need to be involved in some way, shape, or form. So we're responsible. You know, reference the teaching we are given in the parable of the Good Samaritan in the book of Luke. You know, that, more ap- that parable is more aptly called not the Good Samaritan, but the Good Neighbor. The Good Neighbor. Someone who was not part of that group, yet did all he could to help. It's very important that we get to remember what we are supposed to be here as we live our lives on this planet. God never called the church into being in order to make it a means of advancing human and political liberty. That's not the primary purpose of the church. It's not what we're here for. The Great Commission is the church's job description. Remember what it is. Go. And make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. So it is true that everywhere the church has gone preaching the gospel, you know what's happened? Greater liberty 
to the inhabitants has fallen. And the reason for that is because the church has created an atmosphere in which these liberties can exist. It sets the stage for it. It fertilizes the soul, the soil, so to speak. That's the central theme of the Bible, central theme of the Word of God. Righteous Abraham, living in this land of the Philistines, was a greater source of strength in defense against the enemy of that land simply by being there. Abimelech knew you didn't mess with these people. So their very presence there was a help to the people who lived there for centuries. All the plans, programs, armies, defenses, they were the Philistines. But the presence of Abraham allowed those things to flourish. Safety to flourish. Flourish. I tell you what, it's true today as well. Our Lord tells us something about us. What's he, tell, what's he say to believers? He says, you are what? The salt of the earth. The salt of the earth. We are to be concerned about the changing and transforming of people's lives by the preaching of the gospel. When the church focuses on that task, if that becomes numero uno on our list of things to do. It discovers that it has created and it is creating an atmosphere in which political freedom can flourish. It sets the stage for it. Without the stage being set, without that atmosphere taking place, no amount or effort of organizing, of bringing committees together, of programming and policy making can ever succeed in establishing it. Sort of sounds like what governments do, does it not? And how successful has that been and continues to be? Not at all. When we turn from the best, which is the gospel of Jesus Christ, which is doing what God has asked us to do with the, with the Great Commission, when we turn from the best of the from the best to the next best, good as that may be, we're wasting the time God has called us to invest as the church. Because if we're not going to do that, 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 that makes all the rest possible when we focus on what God has placed us here for. You know, we see this in the very last section of chapter 21. Let me go back. Verse 33 through 34. Abraham planted a tamarisk tree in Beersheba, and there he called upon the name of the Lord, the eternal God. And Abraham stayed in the land of the Philistines for a long time. Beersheba is where the treaty was made. Beersheba is a city today in southern Israel. It's a city at the extreme southern region of Israel. It is the last area of inhabitable uh, of, of, of um, arable land before you hit to, and get into the desert. And Beersheba comes from two root words. Be'er, meaning well, which we've been talking about. And Shiva, meaning oath, or the number seven relating to the treaty we just read about and the seven new lambs given to Abimelech by Abraham. Now, in this verse, Beers, we says that we're told that Abraham plants a tamarisk tree. Now, this is the only place in the entire Scripture where Abraham is described as planting anything. He doesn't plant anything at all except what we read here. So, what is this all about, and why a tamarisk tree? Remember, I says all these details we get, they're there for a reason. So, what, what's with this tamarisk tree? Not something we are really familiar with. It's an interesting choice of a tree that Abraham would have planted. First of all, it's a tree that takes about 400 years to grow to full maturity. 400 years. So it's pretty slow growing. In fact, it grows about one inch every year. One inch about every year. It's an evergreen tree. Its leaves absorb water, 
up in the vapor, water, in, into water vapor in the air at night. It takes that vapor and puts it onto their leaves. And when the sun rises the next day, the droplets end up evaporating, which has a cooling effect about in the land wherever they're growing. It's been said that it's like an ancient air conditioning unit. That's what a tamarisk tree is. It also has been found that insects like to get into these tamarisk trees and they transform the sap and they transform the juices of that tree into a white substance that is sweet to the taste. And some people have called this substance manna. Manna. And the whole event is a picture of something that occurs, of course, much later in the history of the Israelites when we get into Moses. Is this planning have the future in mind in doing this? Now, here is old Abraham just planting a tree, living by his well. And this is symbolic of what is taking place in his heart and in his life. He calls upon the name of the Lord. We just read that. He calls upon the eternal God. How often does the church today emulate what we just read about in the actions of Abraham? If the church desires to do anything to help the disenfranchised, the poor, the blind, the bleeding, the struggling, it will only be as Christians who rediscover what it means to live daily in the strength and the power, the purpose and the glory of calling upon the eternal God. We're learning how we do this from Abraham. Because Abraham found joy. And he was the center of blessing in the land of the Philistines. And by being strong spiritually, he did more to advance the case of social justice in that land and welfare in the land of the Philistines than anything he could have done if he'd have started making up his own policies and procedures and said, hey, try this, try this, try this. This works for us. The world outside today is, is really looking for reality. A lot of people say there is no reality anymore. But they are, they really are, you, you can't live in a world without reality. This book is reality. And when you read it, you need to take it as reality. Not what you think reality should be, and not what your folks think it should be, or what the common thinking of the philosophers of the age think it is. This is reality. That's what we need to be into this book for. The world needs people of conviction who will stand for what they believe. And they will not hesitate to say no when it means getting involved in something they know is wrong. You know, the world outside is looking for people. It's looking for men and women who have convictions. And convictions only come from a life that is consistently lived in a daily living fellowship with a living big God. And that is what sent that new church out from Jerusalem in the New Testament days when such triumphant victory over every obstacle was taking place. That church swept everything before them because, not because they were instituting policies and preachers, it was, it was increasing and sweeping everything before them because they were in daily fellowship with a God that was living. They were living in reality. So we must not leave the best for something that is less than good, less than the best. That would be like, that would be like taking a restaurant and having a crowd of waiters in a restaurant running back into the kitchen and saying to the chef, oh, we're, we got some trouble here. We are having a lot of difficulty getting this food out to the patrons, and they're starting to complain out there. We can't get it to them. So 
here's our solution. Chef, why don't you leave the kitchen, come out here and help us? If the cook is wise, if the chef is wise, he's going to look at them like they're crazy and say to them, that is absolutely the worst thing I could do to help alleviate this problem you have for me to go out there and help you. If you have a problem, you're going to have to work that out yourself. But if someone in here, in this kitchen right now, is not cooking the food, you're not going to have anything to distribute. So why, 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 why even bother with it? You're just moving it somewhere else. If there is no fountain of morality in the church today, if there are not lives which are discovering something, discovering the strength and the inner peace and the power that comes from fellowship with God, with a relationship with God, a living God, there will not be anything to distribute. We'd be asking Jesus to come out of the kitchen and try to wait tables with us. He's preparing the food. He is the food. He is the water. God calls us to discharge our duties as men and women in Christ, as citizens, and to do all we can to have spare time to help. But by all means, we've got to focus ourselves every day to declare and share the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's the Great Commission. That is the basis of your job description on this earth and mine as well. We don't have to go out searching for it. And we're not out there to go and change political systems. We're there to present the gospel of Jesus Christ to a world that doesn't know it, that doesn't think it's real. And we do that from a sense of ownership of this gospel because it has been given to us, I guarantee it, it will set the stage for freedom and liberty to take hold, and it's going to make a, dis it's going to make a distinct difference on the lives of nations and people who may come to find that this is reality. Would you bow your heads for me? Lord, we thank you so much for the lessons that we can learn from your son, Abraham. Lord, we, we look at his life and we see how many screw-ups he had, but at the same time, how much we can learn from what he did well. Lord, as we walk through this life, we are tempted to solve problems without running those problems through you, to think that we have the answers, or to listen to someone who thinks they know reality and wants us to join them. But Lord, we need to come back to the truth of your word, to the reality of your life, and to understand that all these stories, whether it be Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses, Joshua, David, Saul, Samuel, we can name all these individuals that present themselves to us in your word. And we see how they impacted the world for you. And we can learn from that, of how we can be influences. And we can present the truth of your love and your grace and your mercy to people today. Lord, we don't want to give away the best in order to do something less best. We want you, and you are the best. And we thank you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Have a great day today.